I'm Andrew, I'm a, a dev. You can probably hear that I'm from the UK. Um, I'm sort of mainly over here giving a talk or workshops sort of yesterday on sort of Freya, which is an F sharp system uh, for doing sort of accurate HTTP programming. Um, but I also said kind of foolishly that I'd give a quick short talk as well on sort of thinking about HTTP and functional programming, um, given that I've spent the sort of last year or so doing so. Um, I actually forgot until sort of the middle of the week that I'd actually sort of said that I'd do that, which was slightly problematic. And I was looking through the, uh, the spreadsheet to sort of see what I'd actually like quite like to go and see. Uh, and I sort of thought, oh, that looks kind of interesting. That sounds like that would be just up my street. I wonder who's presenting that, um, which was an unfortunate way to find out. So, um, so HTTP and functional programming, I thought I'd start this off on a really positive note. Um, the reason I care is obviously I've been sort of spending the last year sort of doing uh, a fairly in-depth kind of approach to, to functional HTTP. Uh, obviously, as I say, sort of I've been working on the Freya stack, which is an F-sharp sort of approach to building a whole sort of full stack of everything from, you know, sort of basically sort of server up to high-level abstractions and hypermedia and that kind of thing. Um, that's a reasonable reason for me to care. It's not a particularly great one for you to care, but there are probably reasons why you should. Um, as much as anything else, because sort of HTTP is just everywhere and getting more so, and it's usually really terrible. So most people are very, very bad at HTTP, and most implementations suck uh, in terms of actually being able to use what it's generally meant for. It's, it's actually a really great standard, but people use about a third of it. Um, so it could be a lot better. It's probably worth making it better. Um, one of the reasons I sort of decided it was more important was I suddenly saw about two months ago an advert for a drone which was HTTP controlled, uh, and decided that I thought that sort of educating people on proper HTTP was now a higher priority, mm -hmm. seeing as 404s could now cause death, it was probably a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I should note sort of that this is a very entirely opinion-based talk, which is a kind of polite euphemism for potentially wrong, but you have no way to prove that. Um, I have this kind of contention that uh, for all kinds of reasons, HTTP is sort of the poster child for one of those systems which people use about a third of but would have a massively nicer life if they actually use the other two-thirds and that was easy to use. Um, I'm not really going to talk about client-side kind of stuff here. I'm mainly talking about server-side kind of HTTP. It's not that the client-side isn't interesting. It's just that I don't know a whole lot about the client-side. Uh, and there's definitely something to be said for picking subjects where you aren't likely to run out of knowledge by about slide four, um, which is this one. Um, so FP is actually a really good sort of approach to, to HTTP. It maps really well to good ways of thinking about it. Um, and now's a good time to do so. There haven't really been many new ideas around approaches to web programming, HTTP, that kind of basic layer for, for some time. And sort of, you know, sort of big companies aren't going to do anything exciting. It's going to have to be open. It's going to have to be community driven. And the community is where we see actually interesting things happening with sort of new forms of thinking around program construction and problem decomposition, that kind of thing. Right now are mainly functional communities. So yeah, hooray for, for us. That's always lovely. Um, there are cool new languages, but things like Go and Rust and all the rest of it aren't really doing anything particularly exciting around sort of web programming. They're building good, solid systems, but they're not anything particularly new. They look a lot like the web frameworks and stacks or however you want to sort of pick that granularity. They look a lot like the ones that we already have. Um, so as a sort of kind of aside, I've sort of had this sort of feeling about uh, sort of HTTP and web systems and this kind of thing. And this is where we get entirely subjective and personal. Uh, and I kind of make myself persona non grata at various programming conferences. Um, so as a sort of an analogy, the AI winter, for various reasons, kind of killed off, or at least temporarily, a load of interesting thinking and development around things like LISP. Um, like the loss of confidence in AI research <coughs> caused that kind of stagnation in funding and interest in all these kinds of things. Uh, and Lisp kind of stopped progressing as a side effect because the people that were wanting AI to produce this kind of magical wish-granting unicorns uh, and had all the military funding kind of went, no, no more of this, so you don't get any Lisp either, um, which is kind of a shame. So it's sort of an unintended consequence of something else that you ended up with this kind of stagnant marketplace. And this is a bit which gets me thrown out of things. So, <laughs> and I mean this with love, like Ruby folk, it's, you know, it, it's, it's great, and please don't hurt me with your troublingly human syntax, which is just uncanny. Um, so it's a bit stifling. So Ruby was this amazing success story. It did amazingly well. Um, 
it did a bit too well, really. It sort of made some things really easy. It got tons of hype. Everyone started adopting it. And every language had to have its own Rails and its own framework. And everyone started building new Rails-like frameworks and stopped asking questions. Um, so this kind of de facto architectural style got created where you know, now, whenever people talk about a new web framework, they start thinking about, oh, OK, how are we going to do the routing? Or how are we going to wire up the controllers or all this kind of stuff without asking some more fundamental kind of questions? So we ended up with this kind of MVC-style framework winning temporarily, hopefully temporarily. But it's kind of, you know, it's going away, but it's still kind of there. We've had years of just, you know, this is how web frameworks look, which isn't really brilliant. Um, we could do a lot better. Um, again, it's kind of very much opinion based, but people got a bit too obsessed with the wrong program. And you know, sort of solving the wrong problem here is kind of what's ended up. We've ended up with this good abstraction for the programmer, but a really bad abstraction for what we're actually trying to do. You know, we've made it really easy to know how to structure a web app. You know, your controllers go in this folder, and you have these views, and this is how you show people things, and that's great. But it's a really bad abstraction over HTTP, which is theoretically what we're supposed to actually care about. We're supposed to care about actually getting data to other systems and having this great communication protocol. And we've actually just made it really easy to organize our code in like neat folders. Um, what we haven't done is made it any easier to really work out how the hard bit works, which is taking your problem domain and mapping it to how do you represent that over HTTP. We've got all these systems, which are you know, these, these existing complex business systems or whatever they happen to be. Um, but we haven't really solved any kind of problems about, right, you know, how do you actually make that work properly on the web and take advantage of what that can do? It's also really hard not to end up with all your logic kind of scattered around various places when all of your structure is based around your web framework and not around what you care about. Um, you know, we've even ended up with sort of MVC on the client side as well, with things like Backbone and all this kind of thing. And again, it's sort of gone through the same kind of cycle where initially this seems so much easier um, because it solved all these problems of organization. It's very reassuring to have this kind of comforting framework around it. Um, but is it the right abstraction? Maybe not. It's an abstraction which is probably actually orthogonal to the problem you're trying to solve. It feels really neat and tidy, but it isn't solving the right thing. So we've made the kind of simple developer-centric parts really straightforward. We've come up with this kind of unifying framework, but we've lost sight of what we actually want to do, which is you know, actually be accurate about what we're thinking. And we've cut ourselves off from how we should be thinking about building systems like this. It's become too easy to think in terms of things like pages and CSS pipelines and bundling and all the abstractions and all the minutiae, these implementation details, and lose sight of the fact that HTTP on its own actually does huge amounts of stuff. Uh, one of the reasons why this matters more and more now is because we're getting HTTP2 coming along. Um, and the model and assumptions actually change quite significantly in terms of what that means for people working with, with you know, HTTP connected systems. If we're not familiar with the existing assumptions, if we don't have the right tools in place now and we don't have the right mental models, we're going to miss out on what HTTP2 can give us as well. So we've got great tools and type systems and this kind of thing for creating the useful stuff for the developer and we've made the dev's life really easy. But when we've actually started to look at the actual protocol, the hardware we're doing, you end up with other stuff, which is not really great again. So we end up with these wonderful, sort of strongly typed, really opinionated frameworks, which are all around how you structure these controllers, but very little to be said around, you know, how do you actually make sure that you're sending the right thing to the client? You know, it doesn't help you at all decide, you know, is this a 406? Is this a 418? Are you actually a TFOT at the time? <coughs> So we've got these blobs of text, if we're lucky, maybe some streams. If we're really lucky, we might get an associative map of things we care about. But it probably isn't anything wildly great to use. And functional tools and functional programming, and by functional tools, I really mean the mental ones that we have. Things like you know, this sort of purity of functions, type systems, potentially at least, uh, give us better tools to think about what this is. So. When we look at HTTP, we've got this long form spec, we've got some grammars, um, we've got a bunch of RFCs, um, but those aren't a wonderfully good place to start. And actually, it becomes a lot easier if we actually start to work with the tools that we're familiar with. So if we start to take, uh, if you like, a type system approach to HTTP, we can start trying to model things in a way that we can actually understand and we can actually make tractable. So if we start to think about HTTP and what we would want it to do, if we were starting from scratch, we might start with something a little bit like this. We know we've got a request. We know we've got a response. 
And then I think, well, OK, that's, that's fine, but have I got a little bit more than that? Well, I have. I mean, obviously, I've got this request to something, so I've got a request and a world state, and then I've got a response. And then, actually, that asks some interesting questions about my understanding of HTTP. So is a request world response function actually pure? Is that referentially transparent? Does that always return the same thing if the world is the same? Well, people argue with me on this one, and people say things like, well, if I had a, a get function, which is a random number generator, then obviously this is not going to be the case. Unless you start getting really hand wavy and annoying like me and say, well, maybe the random number generator seed is part of the world state, in which case, yeah, it is. So it doesn't actually imply nothing in HTTP spec says something about the fact that these things have to be referentially transparent about these. It doesn't do these things, but because we've got a functional approach and we sort of start to think in functions, actually it makes it a bit more useful to start thinking about this. And in our world, it might be the case that actually, yes, this does always be a, a referentially transparent function. This might be pure. We might be able to make these assumptions about our problem if we start thinking about our problem in the right way. We can start to break down what we mean by a request and a response into a way which actually makes sense to us. So we can say, OK, if we're reading some data from a server and we've got some sort of selector which may be interesting in some way, we're going to want to know how to tell the server what we want. We're going to have some metadata which might be something else to do with the query. We're either going to be reading or writing to the server. We gloss over this. Writing might be a put. It might be a post. It might be a patch. But we're doing two things. We're either getting something or we're setting something. So we can simplify our assumptions there and say, OK, right, well, are these really special cases? Are they different cases? Yeah, they are, but we'll model them differently. We can go on and say things like, right, OK, well, our understanding is getting a little bit broader if we start to think about this. We can say that, right, actually, this request is us asking a question of a system and expecting an answer. That's all it is. You know, we're asking a question which is, you know, do you have this? Can I see it? You know, if we say that the metadata that we passed with this sort of thing, if we were designing this thing from scratch with some preconditions, so, you know, don't actually bother answering this unless you meet all the preconditions that I care about, and also don't bother answering if you can't meet my expectations about the answer, so unless you can tell me in this way, I don't care. Um, that's cool, and actually we find those concepts map directly to things like conditional requests and content negotiation, respectively. Um, but we could have come up with those really quite simply if we wanted to create a system which was usable. And it's probably easier for us to start reasoning about something like this or teaching people how to create repeatable, accurate systems when they're used to programming and when they're used to functional programming, especially if we take this kind of approach rather than 80 pages of plain text RFC. It's fun and it's exciting and everyone loves ABNF, but it's not quite as applicable uh, to people actually sort of doing things on a day-to-day -day basis. If you can actually start to talk to people about, you know, yeah, OK, this is great, but is there a precondition where you wouldn't care about this? Here's what a precondition means. Here's its type signature. This is potentially handy. So it's a great opportunity for us to take the functional programming approaches that were useful and apply them you know, better than we've currently done with, with web systems. Uh, it doesn't just apply to HTTP, but it's kind of near to my heart now because of what I've spent the last year doing. So the second chunk of this sort of last sort of 10, 12 minutes of me ranting uh, is a little bit about some directions which we're already taking, which there are sort of interesting things that are happening within the functional programming community within different languages, different scopes, and some things to sort of spark some ideas around there's more to life than, than Rails-like things. So I've skipped all of the functional programming frameworks which are Rails-inspired. I'm arrogantly declaring them uninteresting in this scope. Uh, they're not, but you know, it's, there's only so much time. Uh, and I don't want to imply that there's nothing great already happening, because there is, and we'll see a little bit of that. Um, but it would be interesting to see you know, the more people that we get thinking about these things and taking different experiences from different problems domains and applying it to things like web programming, web engineering, then that'll help. You know, this this cross-domain thinking is a useful thing to have. Reactions to seeing what's out there are usually what spark the next useful idea. And uh, you know, there's, there's definitely something better than Rails, which is possible at some point. And so we've got a lot of functional concepts which we can bring with us, which we can just start off with uh, in non-functional languages, uh, dysfunctional languages, whatever we want to call them. 
Um, we have all kinds of efforts to create things like standards around middleware, um, you know, these complex topics, how we deal with them, how you reason about behavior of middleware pipelines and all this kind of thing. We get all this stuff for free. You know, we, we can actually skip past a lot of these, uh, these concepts because we know that actually half of these things are just function composition or partial function composition. You know, a pipeline that runs, that's great. That's just a composition of functions. Pipelines that runs until it hits a certain thing, yeah, that's composition of either function. Pipelines that maintain the request and response state as we run them, it's composition of state functions. If we want to combine that, yeah, it's fine. We can probably do that. We've probably got some tools for combining these functions already. We have this in our toolbox. So we've got loads of things that we can use. So looking at various things that are currently happening uh, and maybe sparking some ideas off, uh, it's always nice to get some, some relatively new languages uh, sort of shouted out at. Elixir have taken some really great steps as a community in the first stage by sort of specifying how compositionality of Elixir web frameworks and Elixir web modules are going to work straight off the bat. So, yeah, it, obviously it's optional, but they have a fairly strong and small community right now, so they can say, right, okay, we're going to learn the lessons of this kind of, you know, non-compatible kind of world that a lot of languages end up with. And we're going to say, right, okay, plug is how this works. If you want to work with everything else, here's the way it works. It's pretty simple. It's quite lowest common denominator. You can build your abstractions on top of this. Haskell has ended up in a similar kind of world, but much later down the road. They went through various abstractions. They went through things like Hack. Uh, probably ended up with something like uh, Web Application Interface in Haskell, which is at least a sort of functional standard which people can work with. It basically comes down to some fairly simple type signatures which you can implement. You know that if you have this kind of thing, it's tractable to other programs and to other people. We can take some ideas around things like type safe values. <coughs> So, you know, we, we know that we've potentially got some interesting things about type systems, at least in some of the languages in the functional programming world. This is not to disparage languages which have different types of type systems. Closure and all the rest of it are fantastic. Um, but you know, there are some things that we can do where we do have different types of capable type systems. So, you know, one of the things which has kind of been a theme in various sort of talks at this, this conference is making the, uh, you know, invalid states unrepresentable. How, how close can we get to that with the tools that we've currently got? So in Freya, which is the project which I've been working on, I promise not to refer to that too much, um, we have a type system representing basically all of HTTP 1.1. So everything that you might want to do is strongly typed. Anything which you actually work with in terms of writing data, reading data, happens through a strong type system uh, where you can only write essentially valid data. Underneath that, we have this horrible bunch of strings. It's a shame that's the way that .NET works. We're doing a massive mutation of a nasty string field dictionary. But we can hide that with some of the functional tools we've got by applying all this through some lenses and morphisms so that where we've actually got a string, what we see is this beautiful type. When we write it back again, it goes back to a nasty string. It's better than nothing, and it's going to make some of the programming that we do a lot safer. There's some lovely things in the, uh, the Haskell world. So yes, they'll take things a bit further than we currently do. They have a bit more of a type system to play with. Um, they've got things like Haskell extensions in terms of things like quasi-quotation. So compile time checking of more of the data which we're actually sending back to clients or compile time checking of the data which we're using to, to build and compose these systems. So we can have compile time checking of templated content. We can eliminate issues around character encoding, around content issues around having headers which are being valid in certain contexts. So we can actually get the compiler closer to enforcing HTTP standards. There are crazier people. There are the Agda community, and thankfully this one is seemingly abandoned. It's probably too small. Oh, God, no, it isn't too small to read. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> this, this is uh, a small extract from what I can only describe as you know, a massive screed of, of insanity. Uh, which seemingly now abandoned, um, but which is essentially an effort to prove the RDF semantics in terms of a semantic web on top of Agda. Um, in terms of all of it, every single thing is description logics, as consistent proofs, so that if you can construct this, it is by definition uh, RDF. I'm not sure what that gives you. I've never found RDF useful, but it's definitely valid RDF. Um, as I say, it does seem slightly abandoned. I think this was last updated about five years ago. There's only other one person that worked on it. I presume he's found something better to do with his time. Um, it's probably 
if he had the same reaction as me, that was probably because at some point he sort of looked at this and decided, yeah, <laughs> not happening at all. Um, type safe combinators, back to the Haskell world. There's some really interesting ways that we can take composition of programs, we can take them away from the type level and start to build them into larger chunks. So we have this kind of world in FP of you know, our heuristic for what feels like good FP is composing larger things, more complex things from less complex things and smaller ones. Uh, and we've got a bunch of frameworks which are springing up around really interesting type safe combinator models. Uh, so servant is one where you can essentially define your APIs as applicative signatures. In the F-sharp world, we have suave, which is a kind of similar sort of world. Everything is an applicative functor. You pass everything around. Uh, you have a set of operators which you can compose any other applicative functor with. You get something which is predictable and reasonable and hopefully deterministic. Um, there are some interesting plans to make that non-deterministic, but yeah, those, those should probably only be discussed in the pub. Functional modeling is another way which, moving sort of further away from the mechanics and nuts and bolts of HTTP, we can actually start to look at the logical level. So traditionally speaking, you know, in most of these frameworks, once you get a request in, you're kind of on your own. Uh, in a Rails model or anything else, you take over where the request arrives, you hand responsibility back when you're done with it, when you have the response you want to send. Um, so any logic and any sort of interpretation of how you should be interpreting the HTTP standard is down to you, basically. So I do hope you've memorized all of the uh, five current RFCs, the 42 HTTP statuses, and all of the logical gates which you should go through to decide exactly which one of those is relevant and decide whether it should be not acceptable or not found if you ask for something in a form you can't have but it doesn't exist. Um, because HTTP doesn't actually tell you what the precedence for that is. Um, so you can handle all that yourself or you can take different approaches. So Erlang was one of the first uh, languages to implement a machine style framework. Um, if we actually model the process of, this, of uh, handling an HTTP request as a decision graph, as a, a set of states, a state machine that we move through, where each of those uh, state transitions is basically a decision about our request, uh, that's kind of useful. And we can allow the developer to actually say, right, I care about overriding these ones. Uh, I'm going to override whether my resource exists. I'm going to override the types and the representations that are available. I'm not going to override the rest of it. I'm going to assume that the, uh, the graph that's, that's here is sensible. I don't need to care about doing all the nuts and bolts and the legwork anymore. I'm just going to answer a few questions with true or false values. I think Erlang and the Web Machine Project was, as far as I know, the first significant implementation of that one. There are a few others, Liberator and Closure. Uh, sorry, Freya does another one as well, but we take it a bit further. So we actually let you modify the graph and apply functions to the state machine. So if you actually apply functions of state machine to state machine on a per resource basis, you can actually modify how that graph works and what the logic expressed is. So you could say, OK, I'm going to write a function which transforms that graph so it now supports WebDAV as part of its decision tree. Or maybe add HTTP you know, sort of 418 support in case the server is actually running on teapot-based hardware. Um, as, a, as a random thought, it's, I looked up when the RFC was created, the joke RFC for HTTP 418, uh, and sort of realized that it probably seemed a lot less likely that the Internet of Things would actually mean that programmers now would go, yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, I've got a database running on my fridge, and that doesn't get a status code, so why is this even here? Um, you can take that further, too, unfortunately. Um, back to Agda and, and the crazy people in that world. You can take that further and say, right, we have a graph. We can make that a provable graph. Uh, we can actually write a set of proofs so that our default resource graph is guaranteed to return a correct HTTP response. Uh, by composition of lemmas for each stage. And if you want to modify this graph, that's fine, but you have to provide the modification and the proof that your modification is sound. Um, as I say, I would have had a code sample for this, but I've never found a way to actually make it run, compile, or work in any meaningful way whatsoever. But it does look amazingly cool, and I would really love to see it resurrected. So if anyone actually is an actor genius and wants an interesting weekend project, it's probably only a few hours' work, um, feel free. Uh, where would we be without an Idris example as well? So Idris Web, young as it is, is probably the furthest anything can go. So taking its embeddable DSLs, the syntax macros that they actually have to do this, 
they have come up with a framework for enforcement protocols such that all requests have to be safe in terms of all the resources they're using on the server side. So things like making sure that you cannot actually open a database connection, then do something with it if that database connection uh, was invalid, they can enforce at compile time, not just at runtime, which, again, makes things kind of useful. And if you start to look at how you can combine some of these techniques, you can combine things like state machines, type safety, some of the sort of functional principles and composition that we have, you can start to envisage a framework for doing things usefully, which is way beyond what we have at the moment. Functional programming is this amazing sort of uh, visualization tool and understanding tool for understanding systems like HTTP. Uh, other ones as well, obviously, anything where we have a protocol, everything where we have a definition, we can take HTTP, we could take abstract mathematics, we could do all sorts of other things. Anyone that saw uh, Doug McElroy's really lovely talk this morning will sort of see how well Haskell maps to power series. Um, it turns out the programming is actually a much better way of expressing our understanding of these things than just abstract syntax or ABNF or mathematical notation. It's actually sometimes amazingly useful to be able to put these things into type systems and run them and prove them. So on a final note, there's a load of things which we could be doing at this point. Uh, and there are reasons to care. Uh, it's fundamentally, we've got an amazing sort of level of momentum going in the FP community right now. The web sort of framework is often, and the web sort of space is one of the places where we kind of, we kind of lose when it comes to attracting people. I know from kind of painful experience that one of the sort of objections leveled against FP and other approaches on a, on a regular basis is, you know, it's good for certain niches, but it's not good for all things. It could be fantastic for all things, and we've got an amazingly smart community that could add to that. Um, and so hopefully we will you know, find some new lessons, and someone in here will come up with something which is a lot better than we have now. So thanks for listening to me rant.